Um, so yeah, hi, if we've never met, my name is Peter McConnell. I'm an engineer at State Street Bank. Um, the marketing and legal team tells me that's just about all I can say about what I do, but we are hiring. So if you're interested in having a really socially awkward, legally protected conversation after this, feel free to reach out. <laughs> there is some uh, code and live coding in this presentation. Um, what I'm actually coding isn't really all that important. It's really just the top level nuts and bolts of the requirements of what I'm putting together are important. Um, all the codes on GitHub, P McConnell slash talk observability. Um, feel free to go up and grab it, create PRs, tell me my code's crap. So to begin, um, I'd like to just cover off some terms. Um, metrics uh, define a thing uh, that is being measured, and observability is just being able to witness changes throughout a system. That could be latency, throughput, errors, could deploy that's gone terribly. Um, an objective means for system state. And these are the top level sections that we're going to cover. Um, I want to cover off why bother with metrics. It is totally possible to, uh, to build, ship, and run a product in production and never have a single mon uh, monitoring tool set up or a single metric that you're looking at. Um, so I want to try and give you some of the reasons why it's worth a little bit of effort. Um, I also hopefully can give you some guidance on what is worth measuring. There's a whole bunch of stuff out there, particularly with the out-of-the-box free stuff, batteries included. Um, more often than not, there's no real di direct correlation between CPU load and what your s users uh, are experiencing as they're using your applications. Um, and then some uh, advice on how you can get started into it with an overview on Prometheus, which is just one tool. I'm honestly not all that strongly opinionated about Prometheus, but it's a very simple tool to get up and running. Um, and then some live coding that demo got permissions uh, permit and will go well. So why bother? Um, regardless of all this stuff, for me it boils down to an absence of having metrics, numbers that represent how your system's performing. Uh, Conversations about your system are extremely subjective. I think my system is reliable. I think users feel that it's available. I think the last deploy wasn't catastrophic. Um, by putting certain measurements in your system, you can move to an objective place where you know exactly how your system's performing against what you've defined as uh, service reliability for whatever your foo is. So if it needs to be quick to load, how quick? 300 milliseconds per user? Well, why not measure it? How often should it hit that? Let's say 99% of the time. You can start to use those things to inform uh, the SDLC. Do we deploy now? Well, we're actually in breach of uh, our internal service level objectives for this service because we had a, a disaster two weeks ago. How about we invest time in reliable um, reliability engineering instead and hold off that feature push for another week? It's a really useful tool. Um, for engineers to say to engineering managers or product teams, hey, actually, we need to put our focus here. We can't just be constantly shipping features at the detriment of reliability, availability, so on and so forth. So what should we measure? Uh, I can't really answer that for any of you. It's just what's important in the context of your service. That might, you could have a service that you manage uh, which where users don't necessarily care how quickly they get a response back, but they care that you know they can upload 10,000 records and 99.9% .9 of those will be processed. Or you maybe you run a web application and users just want to know that it's going to be fast, so you want all your API transactions to be sub 300 milliseconds. Um, typically, this this portion is where most of the effort spent. Actually, implementing metrics creating fancy dashboards is the easy part. Um, this is a conversation that ha should happen between engineers and product owners um, that are speaking to real users um, so you can work that stuff back and actually track it in your code. So how, how can we start? There's a lot of free off-the-shelf tools that you can jump in and start using. That just is super popular. Prometheus Sensu, yada, yada, yada. I, I wouldn't direct you towards one or the other. If you have time, go explore. Largely, they do the same thing. Um, today, we're going to focus on Prometheus, though. Um, and that's because Prometheus is essentially a toolbox. It's, it has its own UI and dashboards. It has a query language. It has APIs that allow you to programmatically hook into it. Um, it's a time series database. Uh, and it's well supported. 
So originally it was created by a company called SoundCloud by some engineers that came from Google who were used to a system called Borgamon, which is how uh, Google perform internal monitoring. Uh, and since then it's kind of grown up to be quite a large project and it was donated to the CNCF, if that's important to anybody. So how does it work? Um, Prometheus has a configuration file that is passed on run, and we'll get into this uh, during the demo. Um, but it is perfectly human readable. This is effectively a default config that you get um, with all the comments stripped out. Uh, and there's some global attributes you set, like how frequently should we script the endpoints that we've been given. Um, and then there is the individual jobs. Um, so you may have uh, configuration set up for your load balancers, one set up for your, uh, your web hosting servers, web hosting, web facing servers, one set up for your databases, yada yada. Each of these just fall into a different job name. So what is, what do those endpoints actually expose? Um, there is a, an X position uh, format that Prometheus supports, which looks like this. There's a, a helper line, which effectively gets bubbled up to the UI later, which we'll see. Um, you have to define a type, and we'll cover off the different metrics types in a second. Um, both of those are listed as a comment. And then uh, we call out the metric that we want to create. This is defined by you. Um, so in this instance, HTTP request total, it could be biscuits. Um, everything inside the parentheses, or sorry, curly braces, uh, are just labels to help you drill down in granularity for your queries later. So in this use case, later we'd be able to query how many HTTP requests in total have we had, but you'd also be able to query down and say, well, how many get requests, how many post requests, put, so on and so forth. Um, and the final two values, uh, the first 1027 is uh, the actual value for that metric at that point in time, and the last is the timestamp. Um, Prometheus and many of these tools are time series databases that are optimized for indexing this stuff uh, according to time values. So there's four main metrics types in Prometheus. Um, they're a wee bit obscure between these, so I'll try and do my best to explain them, but feel free to ask me to follow up in more detail. The first is counter. Uh, counters can only ever go up or be res reset to zero. So this would be things like number of order orders in a system or <coughs> number of uh, HTTP requests or something like that. The second is gauge, which can go up and up or down. So the question I had in my head is, well, why have both, like gauge uh, is suitable for both use cases. Um, there's some mathematical functions that only make sense if you can guarantee that a number is constantly incrementing, whereas you, if you try and apply the same things to a value set that can go up or down, you end up with graphs that go all over the place and your data no longer makes sense. So effectively, the first two are simply optimized for their use case and the functions that are exposed in Prometheus. The last two, or the penultimate, I should say, uh, histograms. Uh, it samples observations in buckets, which isn't um, in the clearest statement in the world. You can define a front that you want to record latency between 300 milliseconds and 500 milliseconds, and then 500 milliseconds and 700 milliseconds, and so on and so forth. Whenever your metrics are being logged, it won't necessarily care about the accuracy of those metrics when it's dumping it into the bucket. It just sees this thing is 350, it fits into 300 uh, to 500 millisecond bucket. Uh, summaries does the same thing, but it also calculates quantiles. So it allows you to say on top of that, well, what is the 99th percentile of latency over the course of the past five minutes? So 99% of the time, all users were able to load within 550 milliseconds or whatever it is. Typically, uh, you will see service level objectives defining things for latency in this percentile fashion because it's easy to communicate the user that 99% of the time you should experience our product performing this quickly or you should have 9,999 of your 10,000 uh, records that you upload being processed correctly. There is a lot of free stuff that you get with Prometheus. Um, they label each of these as exporters or integrations but these uh, manifest into things like node exporters where you can load this node exporter onto any server in your cluster and it will instantly expose metrics about CPU, RAM, disk, whatever else um, on an endpoint that Prometheus can later pull. Uh, then there's individual service layer um, 
exporters as well. So if uh, metrics that are particular to MySQL or metrics that are particular to uh, system D, stats D, whatever else. Um, because of the exposition format, it's quite simple. You start with that type comment, help comment, and then just the value. Um, it actually doesn't take a lot of effort to go and invent one of these exporters for your own service, but there's a lot out there. Uh, all of this would be useless if we couldn't query uh, the data that's being recorded. So there is PromQL. Uh, it wouldn't be a tech service if you didn't invent your own query language these days. Um, it's fairly simple. I tend to find people get lost in the in the actual mathematical values that you concern yourself with in statistical analysis anyway. Um, but the language format is, is really quite straightforward. Um, you call out your, your function if you want to use one, like average or rate or seal or floor or whatever it may be. And you simply wrap it around the, uh, the attribute or the metric that you call out in your exporter. Demo time, this is where the demo gods are going to steal me. So I have rewritten and changed direction on the demos that I was going to give in this three times in the past two days. So this is almost certainly going to fail. Um, again, the point isn't necessarily the lines of code or the tools. Like I'll be using Docker for a lot of this stuff. Docker does not at all matter to Prometheus. Um, really what I want to get across in this first demo is that I don't want to sell the idea that metrics and observability is a really easy thing and everybody should be doing it tomorrow. Um, but I do want to sell the idea that it's not scary to get started. You can start logging some really rudimentary metrics about your system with very little in investment up front. And hopefully that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to sit down for this. Apologies. Um, so let's just create a new area. Uh, and we have to create the directory first. So what I'm going to do is create this. What am I going to do? I'll create a plain text file and load it in a web server. So when you go to my web server forward slash nothing, um, you will see that type help, and then we'll create. We'll use biscuits again. I don't know why that's in my head after lunch, after all. And uh, at that point, we'll just have a really useless web app. Um, but I will then spin up Prometheus and configure Prometheus to pull um, from my application. Because it's a static file, that value will never change. So our graphs are going to be a straight line and super boring. But hopefully I can get across that in a few commands, you can spin this stuff up pretty easily. So we'll create an app folder. Mm -hmm. And in here, we'll create index.html because I'm going to use Nginx. And that's by default what it sets its index type to. We'll create a help. And we'll create biscuit counter. And this stuff doesn't really matter. Um, total number of biscuits. Should have picked a decent attribute name. So I'm going to set the type of biscuit counter to counter. And then I'm finally going to call out the value biscuit counter. Uh, that seems fine. Uh, oh, sorry, that's really quite small. Is that better? Uh, so here, I have my help line, so the Prometheus UI is able to add some helpers for what my thing is. I've defined a type, so Prometheus knows what functions can be applied to that line that I'm logging. And then finally, I have created a value for my biscuit counter. Uh, so this is still just a file. So I'm going to cheat a wee bit and use a Docker image, um, which we will run on localhost. And we will mount in. Again, if people don't understand what I'm doing right now, it's totally fine. It doesn't actually add to the demo. Nginx, by default, loads stuff from user share Nginx HTML, I think, from memory. We'll soon find out. Uh, and then Nginx, the latest. Yep. So hopefully, if we go to a new tab, load. Google host. Yay. So, uh, close that. I actually can't see how to close that. So, if I go to view source, we'll see that we've now got our three lines that Prometheus can scrape once we create it. But we don't actually have a Prometheus yet. Um, so, and just to prove, I've only got my Nginx container. 
So I'm going to, again, cheat a little bit, and I'm going to run Prometheus in a container itself. Um, so I actually have a function that I created for my own dot file. It's called d underscore Prometheus, but running that on its own won't do you guys any good. So I keep that stuff in a file called docker func. Um, the function is Prometheus. Actually, that won't do any good, and it's probably about 12 lines. Cool. Uh, so, blah, 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 blah. If you can see where the Docker run line is, that's effectively all that matters. So we're saying Docker run exposed on host port 9090, which is um, by default what Prometheus uses. We're using the prom slash Prometheus image, and then uh, the final double dash block line is just a config that we're running into Prometheus. The only line that really matters here is that last one, uh, web enable lifecycle. So Prometheus uses that uh, configuration YAML file to define what targets it's going to look at. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, we're going to change that after Prometheus is running, and then we'll want Prometheus to reload that config. So this web enable lifecycle exposes a REST endpoint in Prometheus um, slash reload, which just tells it to reload the YAML file without restarting. Again, because we're in Docker, if we were to actually restart Prometheus itself, it would kill the container, kill the changes to the Prometheus shamble, and we'd be in an endless loop in this conference hall until we all died. Um, so that should be running. Oh, I didn't actually run it, did I? So that is now running. Yes. Demo gods haven't forsaken me. So by default, Prometheus will log itself. You should eat your own dog food. Um, so it exposes a slash metrics endpoint itself, and that's essentially what this record is. But we don't care about that. We want to track the number of biscuits that we have. So um, again, because it's a container, I can jump in and copy that file um, that we passed in during config, which was Etsy Prometheus, Prometheus.yaml. Uh, Prometheus, Prometheus, .yaml. and I'm just going to dump that out locally. And this is effectively the same config that you've seen in the uh, slide um, with all the comments removed. Um, so I'm just going to clean this up a touch. So that is uh, our default config. Mm -hmm. Let me just echo out. How on earth do you get your IP address on this resolution? Hopefully that's right. Um, so we want to track biscuits. So I'm going to go in here, type in biscuits, jump down. Um, we ran our Nginx container on port 80, so I'll just leave it like that. The only other attribute I'm going to change here is the scrape interval for demo purposes. Well, this is static asset, actually, it won't matter, but that's how you do it. So we have edited our Prometheus YAML uh, on our host system, but we're running Prometheus in our container. Uh, so the last thing to do is effectively reverse the copy process from host back into the container. And now I can run that curl command to tell Prometheus to reload its configuration. So 9090 slash that, I think this is right. Yep. And there we go. So hopefully, wow, that resolution's funky. And we now have biscuits. So uh, it will show unknown just because it hasn't scraped it yet. If I reload, it should have performed this. It should be dying. Cool. Oh, because so. By default, uh, Prometheus will assume that you want to expose your metrics on uh, slash metrics. But we took a real shortcut and didn't do that. Um, we loaded into Nginx root. So you can pass in a metrics path and tell it that your metrics are actually exposed here. Um, so repeat the copy, repeat the reload. Go back here. Hopefully, this slash metrics will go away. And once it rescripts, it should hopefully, what do you see, this won't be my IP. This isn't my IP. Uh, but it's doing it from inside the container. Uh, how do you get, okay, hold on. 
Why on earth do I get my Wi-Fi signal whenever it's this smaller resolution? I don't think so. Uh, la, la, la. Uh, what do you say? No, ten point. There we go. Van Prithius. Uh Di. Cp. Should have checked this actually. Cool. <coughs> Reload. Cool. <laughs> Errors and demos are okay if you can get it back on its feet. Yay, and we have an up. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, so we can go into a graph, and now we can perform a query with biscuit counter. And we can't see the value because of the resolution. <laughs> OK. Well, you can, on the right hand side of that, you would see the static value that we had assigned to, in fact, I should be able to see it in graph. Uh, the static value that we had assigned, which apparently was 91,803. So in the real world scenario, that would be a dynamic value that would be recording the likes of throughput or latency or number of errors or whatever it is. So your graph gets squiggly and your C-suite bosses get happy. Um, so a more real world example now, um, if I can be so bold to attempt the demo gods, I actually can't see the tab that my slideshow was on now. Let's go back, back, back. There we go. Uh. So the next uh, demo that I'm going to show you, I'm not going to code through it all. There's going to be a little bit of Golang in there. The language doesn't matter. There's clients for Java, Python, Ruby, whatever. Um, each of them have a client SDK that you can load into your code. Um, that will allow you to, should this load? Okay. Why should that work? I might need to do it. Super drill down. Um, so in a, in a more real world scenario, you're going to be tracking things that are dynamic, like latency. Um, and for the purpose, let me just try this once more. Is it, is it, is it dynamic? Uh, no, it shouldn't be. Um, but whatever. If you guys are OK with this smaller box, that'll have to do for now. Um, so in this scenario, we're going to take the exact same premise. We're running uh, Prometheus in a container. And we're running a bunch of different um, Golang applications in Docker containers. We have added an Nginx reverse proxy in here just so I won't need to manually jump between port numbers for every single individual um, container. We're effectively doing some real trivial rudimentary round robin load balancing. Uh, and the purpose of this is that inside the Go application, it is making an HTTP request out to a third party website which last night I had to panic dev and rewrite as a local service because I knew conference Wi-Fi would die and that would be the end of this. Um, and we can make a, uh, we'll call out a, a start timer, if you like, and an end timer and work out the duration it took to make that HTTP request. All three applications and that third party endpoint are identical on run. So we're going to see very little variance between uh, app one, app two, and app three. Um, so to show you, um, the impact that you can see in a production system. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, chaos engineering, use traffic control, um, which is a Linux function to, um, to perform some corruption on F0 inside the container. Uh, effectively, I will start dropping packets at random um, about 50% of the time in one of the containers. And assuming everything goes well, we should see two streams of three uh, percentiles all sitting fairly bunched together, and app one at some point should should spike. Um, so let me sit down. How am I doing time-wise? How quickly do I need to run through this? Cool, OK. So, <laughs> uh, talk observability. OK, so we have, uh, let me just delete all the containers. Um, 
So I have a Docker Compose file um, that I'm going to run through at lightning speed. We have a uh, Prometheus, just like I ran Docker run prom Prometheus before. This is doing the same thing with the exact same command. Um, and I'm running up my three apps. These configuration blocks that you see, app one, app two, and app three, are identical. The only cool secret sauce I'd like to call out is that I'm specifically running it with uh, net admin um, capabilities so that I can um, do some trickery with the network and start seeing um, changes. If you don't have that permission pass whenever you're running these containers, you'll get an error from traffic control saying you don't have permission to mess with the network. And also the reason I'm doing this in a container is so that I don't end up corrupting my host systems network. Uh, and finally, you'll see fake party site. This is because I realized conference Wi-Fi was not to be relied on. And I created an Nginx app with a very simple um, index.html, similar to the previous demo that I'll query. So Docker Compose up. Everything should be pre-built, no network requirements. And we are we're running things. Hmm. So local host. So on itty itty, uh, I am running the nginx uh, container, which round robins out, and I have an API slash foo, which loads this free book, Frankenstein, Modern Prometheus. You get it? No, <laughs> don't matter. Um, so in each of these applications. Uh, there's slash API foo, and there's also slash metrics, which has a ton of stuff, and I'll show you how that's created. Uh, lastly, there is Prometheus itself. Um, so if I go to targets, I can now see my three individual containers. Prometheus, for what it's worth, doesn't care about Nginx. So I wouldn't want to get my metrics from one thing that represents many things. In metrics land, you want to know which node's dying, not that a third of your nodes are dying. Um, so I'll take you through some of the code. Uh, again, this is Golang. Many of you may not have ever seen Golang before. It really doesn't matter for the purposes of this demo. It's just what I happen to want to use at the time. Um, the interesting things to call out are that I have imported um, two client libraries here uh, from github.com slash Prometheus, client Golang. There's a client Python, client Java, client Ruby. Um, that have loaded in uh, two things that I'll be using later on in the code. Um, these give us a bunch of stuff for free. So that big chunk of metrics that you see on slash metrics um, comes from this. I'm probably down in about three minutes, so let's accelerate. Uh, here's our main block with our two endpoints, API fee and slash metrics. We have a listen and serve. And Golang, that's how you run your web server. Um, in slash metrics, you'll see we have prom HTTP dot handler. This is, I haven't done anything, that's just for free. Um, that was one of the packages that we imported previously. Um, the only special sauce that we have added for our foo handler is in this foo handler method, um, which, to cut a long story short, uh, does an HTTP.get to fake third party site that is a linked Docker container that's just run in our Prometheus Frankenstein book. Um, and it will read the content of that request and spit it into the body, the world's worst reverse proxy. Um, at the top of this function, we created a start equals time now as our starting marker for when that function was going to start. And we created a deferred uh, for duration, which just diffs. When that function closes, it will diff the start value and the, and the now. Um, we multiply that by 10 to the power, 1 to the power 10, to the power 10 to the power 10 to get our microservices. Uh, and then we dump that into something we've created called summary. Um, and we've set an observe at the end of this line um, so that summary observes the milliseconds. So with that being said, let's create some network traffic. So. Watch for every one second. I want to curl silently localhost uh, itty itty slash API slash foo. Don't care about the output. Cool. So on the left hand side, you can see we're starting to get traffic coming in. This uh, curl request in that little box here is hitting Nginx, Nginx round robins. So app one, app two, app three, app one, app two, app three. 
so on and so forth. Uh, the purpose of this is just so that we can actually see some stuff in Prometheus. Uh, we have, oh, I missed that point. Uh, so that summary object that we decided to set our observation for the milliseconds it took, the duration, um, we provided it a name in that config for foo underscore milliseconds. Uh, again, it was just a name and helper, the observation uh, format that you get. Uh, so I can now see foo milliseconds in Prometheus, which has a bunch of different uh, samples. Uh, this is taken from three different apps. So it, uh, you can see instance equals app one, app two, app three. And the three different values are just the quantiles that we defined in our code. 99th percentile, 90th and 50th. Uh, and we can go over and see the graph. If we zoom in, um, it's all split over a very short amount of time. But hopefully I can end this finally with uh, some chaos. So this is the only line that matters. TC, uh, so we're using um, traffic control um, to corrupt. Oh, I thought that said 100%. That would have been a little different story. Um, traffic control um, to corrupt the F0 inside that Docker container. So the lines above and underneath it are just doing a Docker exec, exec into app one. So not the most elaborate output I've ever created for a program. But after probably about five to 10 seconds, we should see a very large spike in app one. Uh, the reason for that is app one, app two, and app three are each calling out to this fake um, third party site container that I created, but app one's network has been uh, corrupted. So it, should, it normally just takes about 10 seconds to reel. There we go. <laughs> So the real, of course, you're not going to go in, well, maybe you are, but most of the time you're not going to go in and manually corrupt your own networks. Um, the real world scenario for this is the other way around. You want your metrics tool to say, what the heck is that giant spike there for? And you can actually drill down and see what service is calling it, so on and so forth. Your metric will inform where in your log so you can look to see what went wrong. I think that's almost me. Oh, I'm not going to be able to get back to my talk anyway. So a very quick recap, why bother? Um, it provides an objective uh, means to talk about your system. You don't need to say it feels reliable or feels shaky or maybe we shouldn't do a deploy. You can agree as a team between engineering, product and management that this is the bar that we are setting for ourselves. And if we become in breach of our service level objective, then we're gonna focus on reliability and no one's gonna be able to take that away from us. Um, what should we measure? Just what matters to your service. It's all about your context. You'll get a bunch of stuff for free. You can go off right now and you know, create that fancy dashboards for network between your containers, CPU and RAM, but users probably don't care. You know, the, you're better looking at uh, your product with a product manager and saying, well, actually, what do users expect in this system? What should we try and make sure that we're covering? Is there any API endpoint that's super important? Should it have internal, an internal service level indicator that is um, more important than others? All that type of stuff. How can we start? Just pick a tool that suits. I've then moved Prometheus. Just use anything. Um, Nagios is great. Um, Prometheus is free, well-supported, easy to use. Fill your bits. And we ended with a demo that had some lumps and bumps, but worked. And that's it. How to do time-wise. That was excellent. Cool.